Okay, so then we're continuing section 4.2, which was called area. Okay, and just so we can uh, get our bearings again. So then the picture that we were constructing was this, is that we have some, some domain of a function between two x values. So then this is x is a, and we're, and we're going to call that x0. And so then a has two names, x. Uh, this leftmost value has two names, a, and it also we're going to call it x0. And then this, <coughs> this is x is b, and we're going to also call this xn. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to chop, we're going to chop this into uh, evenly spaced vertical slices. Okay, so evenly spaced vertical slices. And so then now for the purposes of drawing, for the purposes of drawing, I'm going to draw just a finitely, finitely many such vertical slices. But understand that I'm talking about this could be n. There could be n, there could be a million vertical slices, a billion vertical slices, but I'm going to draw like seven. Okay, <coughs> so, okay, so these are all evenly spaced. Okay. So the distance between any one of these two has the same is the same distance, and that common distance is delta x. Okay, and in between x is a and x is b, there is some kind of continuous function like so. Okay, now in each one of these. In each one of these slices, in each one of these slices, I'm going to draw two rectangles. Okay, so one of the rectangles I'm going to draw is, so in here, I want to draw the tallest rectangle, the tallest rectangle which, which fits entirely underneath the curve. So here, here is a rectangle in this region right here, which is under the curve. Right? You can see that. Now, is that the tallest rectangle that can fit under that curve? No, I could make it taller. I can make it taller, so then the tallest rectangle that can fit under the curve, at least according to my eye, is this rectangle. Right? So can everybody see that? Okay. So now we're going to do that in every single section. Fit the tallest rectangle that is under the curve. So, and I chose, so eight rectangles. So then now, I gave you the formula for the area of a rectangle. Its area is <coughs> base times height. So then here's eight rectangles. You can compute the area of each one of them by using a ruler that we agree upon. And then you can compute the area of each one of them. And then you can add up the eight areas. And that is an estimate for the area that is under this curve. Now, would it be an overestimate or an underestimate? An underestimate. Because in every case, in every case, we chose a rectangle that is strictly under the curve, right? That is, that is under the curve. It can touch the curve at exactly one point. OK. So then now, we can make underestimates in that way. So now, we can also make an overestimate. Right? And now I'll use a different color. How about uh, red, green, orange won't show up very good. Uh, pink? Is there not a purple? Can you see a purple? Uh, pink will be OK. Pink looks better on that screen than it does on my screen. OK, so then now, 
here, right here in this region, this, this is the tallest rectangle that fits. Right? The tallest rectangle that fits. The, uh, excuse me. The shortest rectangle that is over the curve. That is what I'm trying to say. So, that, so here in this region, this is a rectangle that is over the curve. Is that the shortest rectangle that's over the curve? No, I can make it shorter. So then we're going to, in each case, make the shortest rectangle that fits over the curve. <clears throat> okay, then now each one of those shortest rectangles that fits over the curve, I could compute the area of those eight rectangles, and that could be an estimate for the area under the curve. Okay, but would it be an overestimate or an underestimate? An overestimate. So these two descriptions that I've just given you, they're purely geometric descriptions. Okay? They have names. They are called the lower sum and the upper sum. Okay, the lower sum and the upper sum. And so what we need to do now is we need to very carefully give the algebraic description of what the lower sum and what the upper sum is. So it's going to require some notation and definitions and it's boring but we're gonna make it through this okay so <clears throat> okay <clears throat> so let's consider this particular interval that I have uh, that I have indicated here with Delta X so you can see that uh, the right endpoint of this interval the right endpoint of this interval was where we found the height of the tallest rectangle that's under the curve Right, this point right here. So I'll color it in green. Right, that's that's the x value where we obtain the y value. Okay, that for the rectangle that is entirely under the curve. So how about where is the in this interval that I've indicated with delta x? Right, where is the x value that we use to obtain the y value for the rectangle that's over the curve? The left end point. Right, so you can see that you know, we're sort of sampling the curve. In this interval, for the, lower, for the lower sample, we chose the right point, the right end point, and for the upper sample, we chose the left end point. But it's not always that way. Right? So then, for example, in this interval, the leftmost interval, right, we chose the left end point to sample the curve, okay, and we chose the right end point to sample the curve for the upper one. Right, so it's not, it's not always left, it's not always right. It's not always one of the endpoints because I could draw you, you know, it didn't so happen the way I drew things, but I could give you another curve that looks like this and the sample, you know, the interval could have been something like this. You know, in this case, the upper rectangle would be the right endpoint and the lower rectangle we'd have to sample somewhere in the middle, right? Okay, so can you see that you have to sample at different places to find the lower and the upper tri uh, rectangles, and it is not always the ca it can be the case that your sampling point is an endpoint, but it is not necessarily the case. Okay, so then we have to have we need to have names for these sampling points. So I think I wrote that down last time, but I'm going to write it down again because we have to be <coughs> very specific about this. So then, for the interval, so then let's let's break this down very carefully. So then we're going to partition the interval interval A B into n slices. Okay, so then my drawing that is now scrolled off the screen, that would be the case for eight slices. Okay, so I'm talking, this has to, we're going to get it for any value of n. So then what we're going to do is we're going to define, we're going to take delta x and say that it is b minus a over n. Right, the length of the interval divided by the number of pieces we're going to subdivide it into. Okay, so then x0 is a, and xi is x0 plus i t times delta x. 
So that is to say, right, this one, this, this point right here, this is x0, 1, 2, 3, 4. x4 is obtained by taking x0 and then adding delta x four times, right? Shift over one, two, three, four copies of delta x. Okay. <clears throat> so then, now, these two are enough. These two are enough to completely describe the partition, but I want to note for you so that you can see x in, according to this definition, is b. Right, is the right endpoint. So x0 is the left endpoint. Uh, x in is the right endpoint of the, of the whole interval that we're partitioning. Okay, we're going to further define <coughs> mi such that xi minus 1 is less than or equal to little mi is less than or equal to xi and f of mi is minimal. in the interval xi minus 1 to xi. So that is to say, right, we, we, cut, we cut the domain into so many pieces, in pieces. In each one of those intervals, in each one of those intervals, what I'm saying is that little mi is the place where we sampled to find the lower, tri the lower rectangle. That's the place. Sometimes it was the left end point, sometimes it's the right end point, sometimes it's some point in the middle. We guarantee because of the way, it's guaranteed because of what we've said, the function is continuous on a closed and bounded interval. It is possible to find little mi by the extreme value theorem, right? The extreme value theorem said that the extreme, that the minima occurs either at an endpoint or an interior critical point. That's what the extreme value theorem said. So then it is a fact that little mi has to exist. Okay, now, it doesn't have to exist uniquely. Right? There may be more than one place where the function ha finds its minimum, but it has to exist at least once. Okay, so then similarly, we're going to define big MI, right, little, little MI and big MI, such that, okay, now it's XI minus 1 is less than or equal to big MI is less than or equal to XI, and F of big MI is maximal in the interval xi minus 1 to xi. And so then now, this is just math legalese, and what it's saying is that's where we sample the function in that interval to find the tallest rectangle, to find the upper rectangle. Okay? So does everybody understand what's being said here? Okay, so then now, we, with these, we can now define the lower sum. The lower sum is denoted s little s n and is defined as this little s n is equal to the summation from i is one to n. Okay, now. The lower sum is, is the sum of the areas of those n rectangles, right? So then, what I have to write needs to be, right, needs to be understood as the area of rectangles. So I'm going to add up rectangles. It will be F evaluated at little m i multiplied by delta x. So then let's make sure that everyone is clear about this. Delta x, this is the base the base of the rectangle. Right? That's how wide the base is. What is F evaluated at little mi? The height. Right? The height of each one of the rectangles. Right? And this is base multiplied by height. So that's an area of a rectangle. And then finally, what, is this, what does this sigma notation mean? Sum, right? So what is uh, sum? What is this formula saying? It's saying that the area of, of the i rectangle is, little, is f little m i multiplied by delta x. That's its area, and then we're going to sum all of them up. Okay, and this is a lower estimate for the area that is under the curve, so it is called the lower sum. 
Okay, so is everybody with me? <clears throat> the upper sum Okay, so if the lower sum is denoted little s n, then the upper sum is denoted big S, <laughs> right? Big S n. So now, s is big and little, majuscule and minuscule in English. They look basically the same, so I will attempt to draw it big, and I'll put a hat on it anytime I mean the big S, right? See the little serif right there? Okay, so this is a big S, capital S. The upper sum s n. is big S n is the summation from i is 1 to n of, what do you think? f of big M i multiplied by delta x. So again, this is base times height, the area of an individual rectangle, the ith rectangle, and then we're going to add them all up from i is 1 to n. This one will be an overestimate of the area of the, of the, that is under the curve. Okay? So then now, from this, you, we have two different functions of n. We have little s n and we have big S n. Okay, we have little s n and big S n. <coughs> so then now, we have the following. So then here is uh, the following definition. If the limit of, so let's say it like this. If these three conditions, the limit as n goes to infinity of little s n exists, and two, the limit as n goes to infinity of big S n exists. Right? Because I can easily give you a function where the, lower, where the limit of the lower sum doesn't exist. And I can easily give you a function where the limit of the upper sum doesn't exist. Okay, so if they both exist, the limit of the upper sum and the limit of the lower sum. Now, before I go any further, Please describe for me geometrically what it means to compute the limit of the lower sum. So what's happening? Yes, it's saying that we're going to we're going to chop the area into not not just finitely many rectangles, not a million rectangles, not a billion rectangles. We're going to go all the way to infinitely many rectangles. And our, you know, if the curve is well behaved, then our estimate should be getting pretty good, right? So, for example, this screen, right, this screen exists of pixels, right? So then it, those are just little rectangles. Right? So then, but the screen, you know, it's so fine that you can't see, you know, unless you get really close, you can't really see the pixels so well. Okay, so what we're saying is we're, we're letting the number of rectangles become infinite. And similar, similarly with the upper sum. Okay, so then if, if the limit of the lower sum exists and the limit of the upper sum exists and also the third condition, the limit as n goes to infinity of little s n is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the upper sum. That is to say, the limits of the upper and the lower sum both exist and also they are equal to each other. They're also equal to each other. Then, this common limit is the area under the curve. Okay, that is to say that, okay, on Monday, I took away every formula that you had for area, right? I said, all of them are now illegal. You cannot use any formulas for areas now. Okay, what I've just said is this, that 
I started out, I said, I define for you the area of a rectangle. And then I say, now, here is a particular shape that we can take, right? That looks like the one that's up, up here. Right? So then for any, for any function, right? So if this was flat, it would be a rectangle. If it was a slanted line, it would be a trapezoid. Right? If it was a, I could make it a semicircle so that you can compute the area of a semicircle. Okay? And if you can compute the area of a semicircle, you can compute the area of a whole circle. Okay? So then now, all of those formulas now exist in this definition that I just gave you. Right? If the limit of the lower sum exists and the limit of the upper sum exists and they are equal to each other, then that is the definition of the area. Okay, so now this, this covers all of the, the areas that you ever knew and many more. Okay, so any question about this? <clears throat> okay, so let's do an example. Let's do an example. <coughs> okay, good. So how about uh, find the area bounded by f of x is x cubed <coughs> between uh, x is 0 and x is 1. Okay, so let's make sure that we understand what is being requested. Okay, what is being requested is this, is, okay, I'll draw an axis. Okay, the cubic, right, that's a cubic function, it looks some, something like this. Now, just for the purposes of making my drawing so that we can look at it, I'll say that this is, right here is x is 1. Okay, so here's x is 0 and x is 1. So, can you see the area that is being requested? Okay, the area that is being requested. Okay, it is this. Now, that area, that shape, does not have a name. Right? It's not some named shape. It's not a triangle. It's not a rectangle. But nevertheless, we all sort of agree that it's got an area. It has an area. So then what we're going to do okay, is I don't have time to compute the lower sum and the upper sum both, so I'll just compute the lower sum very carefully. And then you know, I will tell you that the upper sum you get the same result and then we'll say ah the common result is the area of this okay so then we're going to compute the lower sum s n okay and in order to do this we need to very carefully go through that procedure of dividing up the interval 0 to 1 into n pieces blah 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 okay so then Delta X, what is Delta X? Right, it's B minus A over N, right? So that's its formula in the general problem, B minus A over N. What, is, what are B and A in this problem? One and zero. So then this is one over N, right? One over N. Okay, that's what Delta X is. What is X zero? Zero, good. What is xi? Right, the formula. So let's let's. I'll copy all the formulas. Right. So x zero is a. Right. That's always what it is. And on this problem, that is zero. Okay. Xi. Xi is x zero plus i delta x. Right. That's the formula. That's its definition that we take. Now x zero. That zero. And delta x is 1 over n. So then in this problem, xi is i divided by n. Okay, xi is i divided by n. <clears throat> okay, now I have a question. 
right? So then we're constructing the lower sum. So do we need big MI or little MI? Little MI. Okay, little MI. Okay, we need to figure out what it is. So then now, for the purposes of, of illustration, let's look back at the drawing. And I will um, erase some of this stuff so that we can kind of have a clearer picture. Okay. So then, now, we're, what we said is we're going to chop this into n pieces. For the purposes of drawing, I'm going to chop it into like four pieces. Okay. But it, we're, we're really chopping it into n pieces. Okay. So then, if I do that, okay, so there's two, and then I'll subdivide these again. Okay, so then I've chopped it into four pieces. Now I have a question for you. How about in, you know, this is, ah, this is, each one of these has size delta x. In this interval that I've singled out, where is it, that, where is little mi? It's the left endpoint for this one. All right, this one is little mi. How about in this interval that I'm signifying? Where is little mi? The left endpoint. Okay, where is it in this one? The left endpoint. And where it is, it, is it in the other one? The left endpoint. Okay, good. So, uh, so, let me look at this here. Ah, wait a minute. Okay, so then now, okay, so I'm sorry to do this, but I'm going to change it to the, I'm going to change it to the uh, upper sum. I'm changing it to the upper sum because it'll be easier. The upper sum. Okay, so then we're not looking for, we're not looking for little mi, we're looking for big mi. But that's okay because everything else we can salvage. Now, in each one of those, in each one of those intervals, in each one of those intervals, uh, where is, you know, for example, in this one, where is big MI? The right endpoint. So in fact, because, in the, because of this function, up the big MI is always the right endpoint of the interval. Now, why is big I always the right endpoint? Because the function is increasing, right? The function is increasing. And anytime you have an increasing function, right, the right endpoint is always going to be the location of big MI. Similarly, if you have an increasing function, the left endpoint is always the location of little mi. Okay, so then now I have a, a dirty little secret that I will share with you about this section of calculus classes, and it is this. Okay, whenever I ask you to compute lower or upper sums, I will essentially always give you a function which is either increasing or decreasing. Right? I'm always going to do that so that your selection of little mi or big mi is always obvious. It's always going to be the left endpoint or the right endpoint. So does everybody sort of see the way that goes? So that's a little secret, right, of calculus instructors, but it's a fact. Okay, so then big mi, big mi, in this case, is going to be xi. Right? That is to say, right, the right change the color here. That is to say the right endpoint of xi minus 1 to xi. Okay, but we already decided what the formula was for, for uh, xi. We said that it was i over n. Okay, so then now you might wonder, why did I suddenly get to that point in the problem and say, wait a minute, I'm going to switch it to the upper sum? Well, it's, be it's because if I had chosen the lower sum, it wouldn't have been i over n. It w what would it have been? It would, it would have been xi minus 1, and then it would have been i minus 1 over n, and then we would have to deal with that algebraic complication, and I, I think that that is not necessary to get the point across. Okay, so then now we need to evaluate f at big mi. Right, so what is f evaluated at big mi? Well, the function that I gave you is x cubed. It's x cubed. So it will be mi 
cubed. And in the previous line, we decided that mi was i over n. So then, that is i over n cubed. Okay? So any question about this? <coughs> any question about this? Okay, good. So then, now we can finally say, so the upper sum, right, the upper sum, big S N, is the sum from I is 1 to N of F of big M I delta X. And we know what all of those things are inside of the sum, so now we start plugging it in. So this is the sum from I is 1 to N of I over N cubed multiplied by 1 over N, because that's what F of big M I is, and that's what delta X is. So now we start algebraically uh, messing with things. So then now, what is the varying symbol inside of the sum? What symbol is the one that's varying? I is what's varying. N is some fixed constant. We have said that we've said that we are fixing N. Maybe it's a billion. We've said I want I want you to cut it into a billion rectangles. Okay, so then we've made that choice. And now we are going to say for a billion rectangles, this is what you get. Okay, so then the sum from I is one to N of I cubed over into the 4. Okay, now, uh, into the 4, division by into the 4 is just a constant, so I can factor it outside of the sum and say this is 1 over into the 4 multiplied by the sum from i is 1 to n of i cubed. Okay, now, I have a question for you. The sum of the first n cubes, do you know a formula for that? And the answer is, yes, I gave you four formulas on Monday, and this is one of the formulas I gave you. Right? So here's another dirty little secret. Okay. Anytime I ask you to compute these kind of sums, I only gave you four formulas. They are all going to one way or another boil down to one of those four formulas. Okay, so here we have come to the point where we invoke one of those formulas. So it is 1 over n to the fourth, and then the sum of the first n cubes is n multiplied by n plus 1 over 2 squared. <coughs> okay? So now, you know, if I just wanted you to find the upper sum, then you could stop here. Okay, but we're going to eventually compute the limit of the upper sum. So we need to continue with algebraic playing around until we are finished. Okay, so then let's do that. So 1 over n to the 4. Okay, so then now I'll multiply this out, I guess. Uh, and I'll, I'll divide by, right, so this is 1 half squared, so here's a 1 fourth. Okay, so then now this will be n squared plus n, and then now I need to square this. Okay, so this is just really boring algebra is all we're going through right now. So then mm, 1 over 4 into the fourth, <coughs> and then multiplied by, I'll foil, out, I'll foil n squared plus n, so that's into the fourth plus 2n cubed plus n squared. Okay, so then that's what happens when you foil that. Okay, so then now I'll divide this. I'll divide uh, into the fourth into all of this and get the following, that this is uh, what? One fourth, right, because this times this cancels and you get one fourth, plus uh, one over two n plus 1 over 4n squared. Okay, so this is the upper sum. So what this is saying, what this is saying is that if you divide the cubic, f of x is x cubed, into 
in rectangles and you're choosing the upper sum, so your rectangles are over, then that is the area that you will get for any n. A million rectangles, a billion rectangles, one rectangle, okay, for any value of n. So does everybody understand what this means? So now we'll compute the limit, right? So then the limit as n goes to infinity of the upper sum is the limit as n goes to infinity of one fourth plus one over two n plus one over four n squared. Now, can you compute this limit? Yes, right? So then what does one fourth do as n goes to infinity? <laughs> it stays one fourth, right? That's basically the most outstanding feature of one fourth. What about these other two terms? What do they do? They go to zero. So then what is the limit? One fourth. Okay, so the limit of the upper sum is one fourth. Okay, now we could go through the exact same procedure now, except it would be algebraically more involved because the, the algebraic expressions are slightly more complicated. And we could compute the lower sum. We could compute the lower sum. And then we could take the limit of the lower sum and we would obtain what? One fourth. And then we would say, We've computed the upper sum, we've computed the lower sum, we've computed both of their limits, both of their limits exist, they are both equal to one fourth, so the area is what? One fourth. Right, so then I'll just say right here that, you know, now we'll do little s n, and then, okay, so then we eventually compute that the limit as n goes to infinity of little s n is one fourth. And so the conclusion is, so the area is one fourth. Fantastic. Okay, so any question about this example? Yes? Here to here? So I, I, I'm not sure what you're saying. So let me, let me say one thing first. So here's this red box. This red box is equal to this one. That's a formula that I gave you on Monday. So is that your question? Okay, so I gave you that formula on Monday. So then if you, if you accept that, then maybe that's enough. Now, if not, why does it go, why do you get cubed to square like this? If you want to know that, then come ask me in my office hours and I will, I, will evaluate, I will derive this formula for you. But it's not a square, really, because, because what it is, is it's fourth power, you see? Because when you square this out, when you square this out, you get an n to the fourth term. So the sum of the first n, the first n cubes is something to the fourth. The, firm, the, the, the sum of the first n I numbers, I like a uh, first powers, is something to the second power. So generally speaking, the sum of the, f like for example, the sum of the first uh, in twelfth powers will be something to the thirteenth power. That's what's happening here. Okay, so then now I think I can say something that we can all agree on, and that is that this was a boring and uncomfortable thing to do, right? Wasn't that boring? Right? It's important. It's important because it tells us how to compute the area of very arbitrary shapes. Okay, but it's pretty involved and boring. Now, I have some good news and some bad news. I'll give you the bad news first. You're going to have to do this. Okay. The good news is, is you're not going to have to do it a lot. Okay. <coughs> so now, I left something a little bit open about, about uh, the area. Right, so then our requirement for the area to say that the area under a curve is defined, um, you know, you have to compute the lower sum and the upper sum. The lim both limits have to exist and they have to equal each other. And if that is the case, then the area exists. And it is, it is the common limit. Okay, so then just when does that occur is the question. Under what conditions is, will you surely have an area? 
the exact mathematical answer to that question is complicated. Okay, but I can give you a sufficient condition, and this is mostly enough, right, for the purposes of this class. So then, here's a remark. It is this. If f of x is continuous, so if, so two things. If f of x is greater than or equal to zero and continuous on the closed and bounded interval a to b, then uh, the limit of the lower sum, the limit of the lower and upper sum they exist and are equal. Which is to say that the area is defined. So this is a sufficient condition. What this is saying is that if I give you a continuous function, it is a certainty that the, lower, the limit of the lower and upper sums exist and are equal, and that is the common area. That's the area. It's a certainty. Now, this is not necessary. It's not a necessary condition, which is to say, I can give you a function which is not continuous, but nevertheless, it still has an area. Right, so an example would be something like this. Right, so I could say uh, f of x is this, is this particular function right, that looks like, um, say, <coughs> the square root of 1 minus x squared the square root of 1 minus x squared uh, when 0 is less than or equal to x is less than uh, less than 1 and is equal to um, x minus 1 if x if 1 is less than or equal to x is less than 2 okay so now this function this function here oh wait I didn't want to do this this function is is this function continuous? Oh, this function is continuous. So I want to give you one that's not continuous. So I'll say not x minus 1, just x. Okay, now it's not continuous. So then what is this, what is this first thing? What will this look like, the graph of this first piece? Right, what is this? Half circle. Right? It is the top half, the top half of a circle. And specifically, since I said between 0 and 1, it's the top right quarter of a circle. Okay, and what is this thing? A line. So then, this graph has the following appearance. This graph has the following appearance. Okay, so then, it's a quarter circle, like so. And then it jumps up to here. So then this one is open, right? Open. And then it jumps up to here and is a straight line. So then now, this, this uh, graph does have a perfectly well-defined area under it. So then, you know, it is this. Right, this area, and then plus this area. All right, so then now, <coughs> I have a question for you. I, I now give back to you all of the formulas for areas that you knew. So now you know the area of a circle again. And this blue thing, that's, that's a trapezoid, and you know the area of a trapezoid again. Could you compute the area of the circle and also the area of the trapezoid and then tell me the, the common area? Yes. Right? You could do it right now. Okay, you could, and it would be fine for you to just say, well, that's a quarter of a circle, so I'll take the area of that circle and divide by 4. And this other thing is a trapezoid, and I'll use the er formula for the area of a trapezoid, and the area is the sum of those two pieces. Right, so could you compute this area in that manner? Okay, good. So then, any question about this? And the purpose of this example is, is to be in contrast to the previous remark. The previous remark says, 
if I give you a continuous function, it certainly has an area. It's a fact. But it may be that I give you another function that is not continuous. It could still have an area. Okay. And I'm going to want you to be able to reason about this. Right, to be able to compute areas in this ways, in these kinds of ways. Okay, by using the geometric formulas that you knew before you got to this class. Okay, so any questions before we move on? So in order to be mathematically rigorous, right, to, oh wait, we're out of time, aren't we? Jeez. Okay, that's fine. So we'll continue on Friday. <coughs> Wasn't that exciting? I just got so excited that I just lost track of time. <laughs>